Oh, we are back. I didn't see that it started. Okay, so we are going to be finishing chapter one today, and we're going to be looking at um, sections 1.6 and 1.7, which are design concepts, allowable stress, and LRFD. Um, we've we've just been looking at, at finding the, an axial load, and we can have an internal normal force, and we have normal stress and normal force, and we're perpendicular, shear stress, shear force parallel, and we're going to talk a little bit about what actually goes into design, okay? So there are lots of issues uh, when we're designing a building or designing a mechanical piece that goes into a motor or an engine. I mean, this is not just civil engineering or architectural engineering or structural things. Materials are in everything that we use. And, you know, if you're a mechanical person and you think about a shaft that's spinning and that shaft has belts on it, okay, or pulleys, so it's spinning, but you're, it's also then like a beam and bending because it has these offset tensioning loads, right? So it's going to cause that shaft to want to bend. And so when we, we, we talk about design, a lot of times I'm going to go with the structural angle, but you have to understand design is, is in Swiss watches. You know, those, they have little tiny gears and little levers and it, very tight tolerances. If something goes wrong with one piece of that design, it's going to gunk the whole thing up. Okay. So we have to talk about what is the function of the building. We have to look at safety concerns. What's it going to be used for? Um, how much is it actually going to cost to, to, to build? Like what is the material and renting? You know, if, if, if it's the a construction firm, you know, that's going to be actually doing the building, what kind of equipment do they maybe have to rent? Um, what are the materials going to cost and the design going to cost just to get to that, that that point of building? What are the life cycle costs? You know, there's upkeep, there's maintenance. Um, you can see in, you know, Engineering South, they are going to be redoing that building um, because it's just time to, 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 to redo that building. And so we're, we're constantly having to take care of and upkeep. And if a building is around for 100 years, you know, it's not just it's going to cost this much to build, but you have to think about like what kind of windows are you putting in? You know, different kinds of windows, you're going to have different kinds of heat loss and cooling loss across those windows. And so something that may be less expensive up front down the road is going to cost you a lot more money because your utility bills are higher. Um, the environmental impacts, the efficiency, the aesthetics, you know, uh, we don't want to just have the same cookie cutter like here's a standard that works. Let's just use that. That wouldn't be very appealing to our nature of, of liking to see creativity. And, you know, so there's lots of things that go into this. When we're looking at the mechanical considerations, we're going to consider strength um, and stiffness and stability. And they're all different things, okay? So we could have, I like to go back to the mall, the second floor of the mall, if you're walking around that mall. And I don't know how many of you all have ever stopped and you can feel the vibrations in the floor, right? Um, you can. I don't know how many of you have stopped to do that, but sometime if you're at the mall up on the second or third floor, just kind of the walkway that overlooks the downstairs part, um, you can sometimes feel vibration. So it's strength, it's strong enough. That floor is strong enough to hold all the people. Um, it's stable, it's not going anywhere, right? Um, but we can feel some vibration. And so I have to be concerned, like I don't want, I don't want pedestrians in the mall to be concerned. Oh my gosh, this floor is shaking, it's not safe. But at the same time, I don't wanna make that floor system so stiff that I'm having to put lots of extra material into it because material costs money. Um, and so we, we can look at, at all of these different applications and there's going to be the strength, okay? There's going to be the stiffness and there's going to be stability factors that we're looking into all of these things. So what's uncertain? Do we really know exactly the exact load that's going to go exactly in which spot? Do I know exactly how much rain we're gonna get on a daily or a yearly basis? Do I know exactly how many books are gonna be on the library shelf in the library that I'm designing? Um, loads are gonna vary. I mean, we, we might know a, a, a use for a building, but the actual amount of books on a shelf could vary and uh, the rate of loading could vary. If you think about a bridge deck, and you look at the dynamic loading of cars going across that bridge deck, a ginormous semi that's 
weighted down traveling at 80 miles per hour is going to have a different type of a load than me on a Vespa that's going across at 30. Okay. And materials, you know, we, when we order concrete, you all that are in construction engineering, um, many of you have had internships and you may have worked outside. Uh, you test the concrete like it's just it's part you, you the concrete is ordered and and then you do some tests to make sure that what you ordered is the, is the strength that that you that you wanted um strength could change overnight over time there's degradation right there's things out in in the in the environment uh we could have some degradation of the area of the material itself the environmental conditions may be absolutely different than what we're assuming them to be um you know i look in oklahoma our weather is so unpredictable and you just never know you just never know what's going to happen um if we are designing something new the material we use in our prototype might be different than the material we actually are able to use um, on the big scale large scale in production um, there could be stresses introduced into a material just on fabrication. Fabrication, if you look at material um, like steel, and, you know, it's going to be heated, it's going to be cooled, it sets room temperature, it's put on the back of a truck, it's driven through a blizzard, it's put um, in the desert of Dubai to, to be built. So that, that steel member has gone through all sorts of temperature changes <laughs> before it's even put in place. And every time you have major temperature changes, you're going to have... Uh, stress introduced into that beam. Um, the workmanship could d diminish, d diminish the strength if you aren't um, using the standards in putting something together. Um, we could have, if we're looking at a system and I'm supposed to have, you know, a bolt at every six inches or nails at every six inches on center and it's not built that way, then I'm, I don't have the, the fastener capacity that I'm expecting. There's going to be some problems that, that are, that are, that are caused because it's not designed. It's not built the way that I designed it. And if it's not built the way I designed it, then it's going to have effects that I didn't take into consideration. Um, the models that we use, yeah, most of this stuff, some of you are like, I don't need to learn statics, it's all a computer program, I don't need to learn strengths, it's all going to be modeled for me, but it's only as good as the information I put in, right? There's different programs you can use, but it's all about your boundary conditions and your assumptions, and so the end product of the information spit out at the end of the day is only as good as the model that I use and the information that I put in, and sometimes we tend to oversimplify, okay? Um, so let's talk about loads. When we have loads, we have what we call dead loads, which would be the structural weight, the weight of the, the member itself, the weight of the building, the weight of whatever the system is, um, anything that's permanently attached, um, that would be a dead load. So live loads are going to be things we can move around. People are live, but furniture is also live because we can move it around from day to day. You know, if you have a dorm and you have a common area, the students may decide, okay, we want a movie night tonight and let's move the furniture here. Okay, well, no, we want a game night tonight. That would be a live load. It's not attached to the building itself and it, it can be moved around. Um, also, duration and location. We could decide, I really want that sofa in my bedroom, so we're going to move it. Okay, no loads, wind loads. Now, I mean, we can look at hist history and the historical data in terms of snow loads. And in the state of Oklahoma, you know, we have that 100-year storm. We, we statistically know what we're likely to get. And it's a much different snow mass than if we lived in Anchorage. So they're going to have a different model or a different value that they're going to use for their 100-year storm or however it is that they're going to uh, tackle that snow load. It's a much different issue in Anchorage than it is in here. Okay, so, you know, it kind of comes down to how safe is safe enough because we could over-design. Heck yeah, we could over-design. Like my, you know, my friend's toddler could design something with huge, giant members where we have to crawl through because there's just structure. Um, that would probably be pretty safe, right? But how much is that going to cost and how feasible is that and how, you know, Economical is that because we'd have to build this huge footprint of a building to have workspace, right? Um, so cost and bulkiness come into that. So we have to kind of balance, balance all of these things. And there's two philosophies. One is the allowable stress and one is the load and resistance. Okay, with the allowable stress, it's in section 1.6. 
and we're, we're going to be reducing the stress that we would design with by a factor of safety. So we're just looking at the stress side of things, okay? Um, if you've had the strengths lab or you've had material science, you've made stress strain curves. We, are, we aren't quite there and we'll get there in chapter three um, and we'll learn about stress strain curves. But if I'm designing, looking at the yield stress, that's where I go from that elastic behavior to plastic behavior. I don't get the, the back to the original length after loading in the plastic area. So if I'm looking at my yield stress, then I might be reducing it by two or three factor of safety. And instead of 36 KSI for steel, I might use 12 KSI for my design. Um, if I'm looking at the ultimate load, if I, you know, 60 KSI is my ultimate stress, then I might base my loading or my, my design on ultimate, but I might reduce it by a factor of two to three. Um, the load and resistance, load and resistance, we're going to reduce, reduce um, the material properties itself, the stress values, and we're going to increase our loads. So we're not just working on the, the strength side. We're not just reducing that strength. We are reducing strength and increasing loads. Okay. So with the allowable stress design, if I have a material and it has a yield stress, and here if we look at that yield stress, it looks like it's about 58, then I might use a factor of safety and reduce that yield stress by 2, by 1.5, by 1.75. And instead of using 58 KSI, I may be using 35 KSI. And that's what I'll, I, I want to keep it within the elastic behavior region of my material. I want to make sure we stay in the elastic region. And so I'm just going to reduce it lower into the elastic region, and that's how I'm going to do my design work. Okay, so, you know, we're looking that the elastic stresses produced by service don't exceed some minimum elastic stress that we've set. Okay, um, it's an allowable stress. It's, it's allowing us to have reserve material strength. Okay, because if I'm designing for 20 KSI, but I could go up to 60 KSI, I have a pretty big factor in there. Of, of strength that's built in for anything I wasn't expecting, okay? So when we're looking at that, we are reducing, we're reducing, reducing that stress. Um, if I am reducing the failure, the stress, the normal stress and the shear stress, the failure um, stress, the fracture stress, then it's the actual fracture. That's what I'm, and I'm reducing it down because I don't want it to break. Like I literally don't want the system to break. If I'm trying to limit deformations and I want to stay within the elastic region, okay, the elastic behavior region, then I'm going to use that yield stress instead, which is a much lower value sometimes than the, that uh, failure, okay? So it depends on, on what kind of design I'm looking at, okay? Typical value is 1.5 to 3. So it's, it's that reduction. Um, with load and resistance, this is for those of you that are civil or construction or architectural engineering, um, the design base is this load resistance factor. We are going to increase loads and decrease that strength, that resistance. So we're decreasing and increasing um, for the unknowns, for the unknown. So we have built in strength. We have built in strength, not as much as we would with the factor of safety. But we have some built-in reserve strength, but we're also going to increase the load values, okay? And it's going to depend on the type of load and, and the type of scenario. If you look in the steel manual, um, there's six or seven different load scenarios that they, they kind of look at in, in increasing the load values, okay? It's all based on statistical uh, statistical information, Um you know, if you want to talk about weather, let's just talk about weather, snow loads, okay? So in the state of Oklahoma, which is where we are, statistically speaking, what are the chances of, of us having a 100-year snowstorm? What are the chances of having this kind of event, okay? Where do I want to design? You know, I need to design with safety, but I, I can't plan for a 1,000-year storm and make any money and have a functional building that is not just a big hunk of hunk, okay? So... Um, and we also, you know, if you are buying timber from someplace, you're buying two by fours, 
and all this wood is coming in from the forest and it's being cut to size so that it can be sold at Lowe's or wherever, they're going to be testing. They're going to be testing those two by fours for different scenarios. Um, tension with the grain, uh, tension against the grain, you know, and and so statistically speaking, you have a pretty good sample if you're if you're sampling some of this lumber coming out to see what the strength really is. OK, so we can we have a statistical understanding of this is roughly, you know, between here and here, strongest to weakest of, of the material that's coming out of that factory, that that plant. I guess it'd be a sawmill and not really a factory. Um, and so it, it comes down to it's it's a statistical game. So we, like I said, we are going to decrease that strength. We're going to have a little bit of reserve. That's our resistance. Our resistance is the strength. We are resisting deformation with our very, very strong beam resistance. We're going to decrease what, what's allowed, kind of. And so we have a little bit reserved there. And then we're going to increase our loads. And like I said, we have dead loads, live loads, snow loads, wind loads, and they will have different factors of increase um, depending on how you want to put, put them all together, okay? Um, so typically less than one for strength and greater than one for loading. Um, so if we're overly conservative, if we're overly conservative, we're going to have basically a 0% chance of failure or, you know, probability of failure. If, we're, if we under design, we're under conservative, um, then we have a much higher risk of failure, which probably reaches unacceptable, like unacceptable, right? So again, it's that balance of, of I need to make money. Um, the system has to be something we can actually build. It has to be useful, and but it has to be safe. It has to be safe. So statistics are huge um, in this. So we might have different... Um, ways that we look at, sorry, I'm trying to get that up, at loading. Um, again, in the steel manual, you can look in there and it's going to have uh, different combinations. So we might look at the ultimate load combination and that's going to be 1.2 times dead plus 1.6 times live. Okay. So we're increasing, we have a greater uncertainty with live loads. Like uh, if we design a building, we know what the members weigh. I know how big, how big this 10 by 15 concrete beam is. I can pretty much tell you how much that thing's going to weigh, right? Our live loads, they're a little bit less certain. So we have a greater, a greater chance of getting it wrong, getting it wrong, right? So we can increase it, the live loads a little bit more. Um, we could look at 1.2 dead plus 1.3 wind plus 0.5 live plus 0.5 snow. Like what's the possibility of a huge wind event with snow you know, and, and here's the deal. If we do have a lot of snow, which right now we have in Oklahoma, it's really icy and snow, is anybody going to work or is campus closed? So campus is closed, which means all the live of people walking around and, you know, doing their business in the building, there's no live because we're all at home because it's cold and icy. But our wind and snow loads are happening and so that's why when we look at these combinations that live load it's it's now shifting lower because people aren't in the building because we are having a wind and snow event and that's where the statistical things comes into play like what's happening during a, during a hurricane in florida like are you out at the mall shopping or are you in your car escaping the hurricane zone so the wind event is high the live load is gotten low and so we can look at all of these different combinations. It's actually really kind of cool and make a design based on that, okay? So again, you know, the limit states defined by strength. Uh, we wanna have safety. We wanna protect human life. Um, serviceability, we need it to perform under uh, just ordinary load uh, conditions. Um, we need to consider deflections and vibrations and cracking um, because they might not have a strength ramification, but it could be a functional or an economic ramification. People don't want to go to the mall because the floor vibrates too much. Okay. Um, I don't want to see a beam that's bending because I think the whole system may fall down. Um, and that being said, there are actually members designed into a system that are designed to fail. 
when an earthquake comes, okay, when an earthquake comes, we don't want a catastrophic failure. But if we can, we can pinpoint some members that are designed to fail, that energy coming in from the earthquake can be absorbed by these members that yield and fail so that the rest of the building doesn't have to yield and fail or yield and yield and yield so that people can get out of the building before it fails. So it's actually really cool that, that in design, there are systems put in place that we, we can plan where the failure is going to occur so that human life can get out while we go through this elastic and then plastic, you know, yielding, yielding, yielding before we have catastrophic failure. So it's actually, there's some really cool stuff that goes on in design work. Um, same with, I mean, mechanical systems. Once you have anything that's spinning, you have cams that are spinning, you're going to have vibrations. And if you have very fine little tiny wires and things that are in a system, any type of vibration could really throw the whole thing off because little tiny wires may not be touching the way that they're supposed to be. Okay, we didn't cover bearing stress the other day. Bearing stress is what it is. It's bearing down on something. So why would we have at the base of a column a larger area <laughs> than the column just pressing down? I mean, you all have probably been outside at some point when it's wet. And if you take a stick, you know, especially when you're a kid, you could poke a hole in the ground with a stick, right? Pretty easy to poke it in because that surface area is, is not very large. So the force that you're putting is stress, force over area. Okay, now if you were to take a, 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 the end of that stick and you were to put, I don't know, uh, like, I guess take the whole shovel, like make the shovel flat and try to put the shovel into the ground flat. Think about it that way. Why do you shovel with the shovely part into the ground and you don't shovel just like taking the whole shovel and laying it flat to make a big hole? Because it's force over area, right? The same amount of force with the tiny edge of the shovel is going to create more, like, you know, the ability to cut through more dirt than if I take the whole shovel and try to lay it flat. So if we have a column, which might not be very large, but has a lot of force coming through it, we kind of need to spread that out so that we're not like poking through the ground. Okay. So that would be, be that bearing stress. And again, if I'm pressing on something that's perpendicular, perpendicular, so the area is the base of that bearing plate that I'm looking at in terms of what is the area. If I have a steel plate, we've kind of already looked at this. Well, we looked at the steel plate could yield, um, the shear pin, that's a shear pin in there, that, that bolt could yield. What else could yield? Well, if I look at this diameter, as I'm pulling this off, I could have bearing stress that's occurring on the, the back end of this hole, which means that I might have started with a really tight fit, but over time, if I have some bearing stress on the back of that hole, I go from a circle hole to more of an oval hole, and now I've got play in my joint, right? That may not be acceptable in a mechanical system, okay? I don't have room for that. I may have some really tight tolerances. The other thing that could happen is, so that would be bearing on the back. The other thing is we could shear through the back, we could shear through that bolt, could just shear through the back of the steel plate. That would be a shear stress because the area would be the thickness times the length of the piece in the back. So the bearing, if you're looking at bearing stress in a bolt hole, it is going to be the thickness of the plate. See the thickness and the diameter of the bolt. That's what you're going to use for your areas. Diameter of the bolt, thickness of the plate. Okay. So um, these just kind of look through all of these and think about all the modes of failure. If I'm pulling on this right here, that 20 kilonewtons, I could have failure of the actual pin part, like it could just stretch and fail, okay? I could have, if it's like a bolt, this inside part, kind of where it's, you know, how you can see it on the bolts, there's like a round part and then the, the hexagon part. I could shear through right here through the middle, right there, shear through there. I could I could shear through the circular part and it would be the diameter of the whole of the wooden piece or the brown piece. I could have a bearing stress failure. So there's lots of different mechanisms. If I have a lap splice like this, I could have failure of the actual lap splice member itself. That would be normal stress P over A. 
okay? I could have, look at this one. This is where the bolt has sheared out the back, sheared out the back. So it's, it's shear stress because it's parallel to that surface. And then it's gonna be the thickness of the plate times the length that's behind that bolt, that 20 millimeters. I could have a bearing stress. I could have right at the back of there um, where it's, I can make the, the hole could get bigger. That's bearing stress. So there's lots of different things that could fail and they're either gonna be a normal stress or a sheer stress failure. And you have to understand which one they are so that when you're grabbing books out, you know, tables out of a, a, a book, do I grab the normal stress that's allowed or the sheer stress that's allowed? Because they're gonna be different numbers. So anyways, um, oh yeah, failure of the bolt by shear. So that's like four different methods of failure just for this one little tiny example of a bolt in a plate. Okay, that's that's a lot. Okay, I'm going back. Except I'm not because it's over. And now I'm sharing my whole screen and I don't know how to change it. So anyways, I will put some examples up in just a second.